Well, as I ascend the high pulpit here and look down on you all, I just want to say, uh, first of all, Mark, you kind of stole my thunder because I was going to talk about the fact that uh, the two men that, that preceded me today speaking to you are two of the men that I count as mentors. There are three of them in my life, three guys that, that I would say have, uh, have shaped me as a Christian, as a man. Uh, one of those in the first uh, and most profound, I think, is my, is my father, um, who's not a preacher of any kind. Uh, and then after that come two preachers, uh, Mark Dever and Al Mohler. So uh, it's an honor, but also uh, a somewhat frightening thing to step into a pulpit behind those two men. So uh, you've, you've gone from the, the spiritual and exegetical giants now down to the pipsqueak. So thank you all for, thank you all for still being here. I, I'm excited to talk with you today about this, this whole topic of conversion. Um, it's, uh, it, it's near and dear to the heart of every Christian, I think. And uh, I, I want to talk with you over the next few minutes really about m- more the spiritual reality that lies in the center of conversion. What exactly is going on spiritually when a person is converted from death to life, from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of, of light? If you've been listening and following along with us over the last a uh, few hours. I, I think one of the main ideas that would have come across from what Mark has said and what Al has said a little bit earlier on is that, that conversion, becoming a Christian, being taken from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, being given new life, it is not just a decision that you make. It's not just a matter of turning over a new leaf. It's not just a matter of deciding that you're going to do some things ethically different than the way you did them in the past. It's not just a matter of deciding that because your kids have reached a certain age that now you're going to go to church and make sure that your kids are raised in the church. Conversion is actually a miracle of God in which he creates life in a place where there had been only death before. So as much a miracle as Lazarus getting up from the dead, as much a miracle as Jesus himself being resurrected from the grave is your conversion from being a non-Christian to a Christian. It's not just a decision. It's not just a matter of turning over a new leaf. It's a miracle of God. So I want to dive a little bit deeper into that and look at some of the mechanisms, some of the spiritual reality that lies inside conversion. And I want to do that by looking at some verses in particular from Romans chapter 6. So let me invite you to take a Bible and turn to Romans chapter 6. That's where we're going to be for, uh, for the next few minutes. Just by way of background on the book of Romans, Romans was written in about uh, 57 AD in that year by a man named Paul, who was one of the two most influential followers of Jesus in the early Christian church. He was a missionary. He understood himself to have been specially called and commissioned by Jesus to take the gospel of salvation to all the nations of the world, particularly Gentile nations. Those would have been the, the non-Jewish nations of the world. And so Paul, the apostle, spent his entire life preaching and planning churches, and along the way, he wrote letters to some of those churches that eventually the Christian church recognized as being inspired by God or being scripture. Well, this letter in particular that we're looking at today, from this letter of Romans, was written to the church in Rome, probably, we think, as far as we can tell, from the city of Corinth. That's where Paul wrote it from. This letter, though, is interesting just on its face, because Paul didn't plant the church in Rome. He, in fact, as far as we know, as far as you can tell from just reading the letter, he'd never even been there, but he's on his way to visit this church in Rome, and he wants to introduce himself to this church even before he gets there. Essentially, he wants them to know that the gospel that they believe as Christians is, in fact, the gospel that he himself preaches, and he's going to ask them for help getting the gospel on to the, to the uttermost parts of the earth. So he sends them this beautiful letter, and lays out for them this this gospel that he preaches. He wants them to know, I believe and preach the same thing that you do. So today, I want to spend some time looking at with you the first 13 verses of chapter 6, where Paul starts this new section of the book that's teaching, essentially, and at least on its face, about a Christian's relationship with sin. So for for chapters 6, 7, and 8, he goes through... Uh, and describes a Christian's relationship with several different things. And the first one that he, uh, that, he, that he approaches, at least on his face, is a Christian's relationship with sin. Now, th- the basic message that Paul has when he opens up this topic of a Christian's relationship to sin is pretty unsurprising. I mean, you're, just, you're not going to be surprised by it at all. It's just that the Christian life is not to be marked by sin, right? Now, who's surprised by that? N- nobody. But in these first few verses of chapter 6... Paul actually gives that whole thing a turn that ends up catapulting us into this enormous reality. And I actually think it's a reality that underlies the whole of the Christian gospel. 
In other words, this in Romans chapter 6 is not just a parenthesis that's dealing with an objection. Paul is talking about something that lies at the very root and foundation of our salvation. But, amazingly enough, it's also a reality that Christians very seldom think about, I think. So look with me at Romans chapter 6. I'm going to start reading in verse 1. He says there, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also will live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. And so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not, therefore, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. All right, now I'm going to give you in just a few minutes a, a, a couple of sentences that I, I hope anyway will encapsulate what I think are the main idea of these verses. But before we get there, I want you to see what Paul is doing in these opening verses of chapter 6. At first, when you start to read verse 1 of chapter 6, it looks like Paul is just kind of answering a sort of run-of-the-mill objection. And the objection is, listen, Paul, you've been talking for the first five verses of this book about grace. You've been saying that salvation cannot be earned. It's, it's not a matter of just doing this set of things and not doing that set of things and making God like you more. That's not how salvation is won. You keep saying, Paul, that we're all hopeless sinners. We're all doomed to be under God's condemnation. And yet God, in, in grace and in mercy, saves. And you've been saying for five chapters that salvation is all about grace. But if that's true, if it's true that grace covers sin, and that that's how we're saved, then Paul, can't we just go on sinning as much as we want to go on sinning? If it's true that we don't earn our way into heaven, and if it's true that grace covers our sins, then why don't we just go on and sin as much as we want to? And, and Paul answers, no, you, you can't go on doing that. Now, now there's nothing surprising in that. We've already, we've already mentioned that. And in, and in fact, you can read this chapter, if you're not careful, and if you don't kind of look under the surface just a little bit, you can read this chapter as if Paul is just kind of this frustrated old man who's kind of, you know, batting away these objections from somebody that he's kind of impatient with, right? It's just, it's all, all these little phrases in there. By no means, you know, God forbid, absolutely not. And then this, this question in verse 1 or 2 where he says, don't you know this or don't you know that? He can just sound really frustrated. But I don't think that's, what hap I don't think that's what's happening, and I don't think that's how we should read the passage at all. Not a frustrated old man batting away an objection. I think what's going on in Romans chapter 6 is that Paul is using this question about a Christian's relationship with sin to uncover this mind-blowing truth, not just about our relationship with sin, but more importantly and more profoundly, our relationship to Jesus. And what he does in these verses is that he, he unfolds that reality and that truth a little bit at a time. It's, it's kind of with a, I, I think, as I read it, Kind of with a smile and a, a sparkle in his eye, you know, like a, like a doting father who brings out gifts to his kids at Christmas time. And you pull back the wrapping paper just a little bit and see how they react. I, I think that's what he's doing. So he raises this question, why don't we just go on sinning? And he says no, you know, by, by no means. But, but look what he says in verse 2 there. Look how, he, look how he introduces this thing. He says, how can we, so can we go on sinning? No. And why not? Well, how, he says, can we who died to sin still live in it. Now, now, to you and me, that phrase doesn't hit with all the force that it could or maybe even should because we're so used to hearing that kind of thing. But if you're just reading through the book of Romans or sitting in a first century church and having the book of Romans read to you, 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 you stop at that sentence. You go, well, hold on a second. 
What, what is this that you've got there in verse 2 about Christians having died to sin? What does that mean? Because Paul hasn't said anything remotely like that yet in the whole book so far. It's a mystery. It's like, it's like pulling out the gift and pulling it back just a little bit. Don't you know that we who are Christians have died to sin? And you're supposed to be left kind of thinking, what, what, what does that mean? Paul, how have we died? You haven't said anything about us dying. You've said stuff about Jesus dying, but you haven't said anything about us dying. Or is this just a, a metaphor that you're using? Is it a literary image? Well, then he continues to unwrap it in verses 3 and 4. And again, I, I don't think it's a scold so much as a kind of tease. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as he was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we also might walk in newness of life. He's opening up an incredible mystery. Now, now listen, because the reality that Paul is introducing here, this mystery that I think he's unwrapping in these first few verses, is I think dollar for dollar, arguably the most underappreciated and underemphasized doctrine in Christian theology. And, and, and yet, when you start to understand it, it turns out that this reality that Paul is unwrapping here is actually the very foundation and root of the gospel. It's, it's what secures and makes right and good and fitting, in fact, your salvation. It's ultimately the source, and, the source and, uh, and of all strength and comfort that you've got in the Christian life. So here's the main idea, I think, of these 13 verses of Romans. I like to do this for my church. I just give them one or two sentences that I, that I think grab the main idea. So I tell them, you know, if you're a note taker, write these down. They'll be the most important two sentences you've got. Uh, if you're not a note taker, write them down anyway because it won't take you that long to do it. And then you can go back to, you know, listening. But this, I think, is the main idea of Romans 6, 1 to 13. And if I'm doing this expositional preaching thing correctly, it should be the main idea of the sermon too. It's the main idea. This is what underlies and secures and powers your salvation that you are intimately and vitally united to Jesus Christ. Here's what underlies and secures and powers your salvation. You are intimately and vitally united to Jesus Christ. And what Paul's going to go on and talk about through these few verses is that you, as a Christian, are in him and he is in you you have died with him. You have risen with him to newness of life. And the ramifications of that whole thing are just explosive. So that's what we're going to be talking about. I want to talk about it with you in four points, really. Here's number one. Here's number one. The glory of the gospel isn't just that you've been saved by Jesus, but it's that you are really and truly united to Jesus. If you're a Christian, then the, the, the glory of the gospel is not just that you've been saved by him. It's that you're really and truly united to him. That's... That's the first thing we're going to talk about. Just unfold this idea of union with Christ because that's kind of the spiritual insides of what's happening when you're converted. You are united to Christ. Number two, more particularly, you have died with Christ, according to Paul. Number three, you have new life with Christ. And then number four, we're just going to think about some of the implications of that for ourselves as Christians and for our churches. So number one, for those of you who are writing them down, you, you are really and truly united to Jesus. First thing we're going to talk about. Second, you've died with him. Third, you have new life with him. And fourth, just thinking about some of the implications. So point number one, if you're a Christian, you are really and truly united to Jesus. That's the main thing that Paul is uncovering here for us in chapter six. It's why he brings up the objection in verse one in the first place. It's not just that it's an objection and a parenthesis that he needs to deal with in order to go on with the rest of the argument. In Romans 6, you're still on, as Mark used the image a little bit earlier, you're still on the trunk of the tree, so to speak, of the argument. Paul brings the objection up about a Christian's relationship with sin in order to talk about union with Christ. So, yeah, he, he needs to deal with this obvious objection, right? But he does it by catapulting us into this reality of our relationship with Jesus. That we are united to him so that what happened to Jesus also happens to us. Now we're going to talk more about that in just a few minutes. But I want you to notice a couple of things here. First of all, that phrase there, died to sin, is not an ongoing thing. The tense of the verb doesn't allow it. 
It happened. It's a simple past tense. It, it happened at one time. You died to sin. Well, well, when did that happen? Well, it happened when you became a Christian, when you put your faith in Jesus. Now, to understand that helps us to understand, too, why Paul brings up baptism here. Now, you see how he, he brings that up in the very next verse? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus? I, I think that's surprising to most of us because we don't tend to think very much about our baptism. But for Paul, baptism was a, was a huge deal. Baptism was sort of the starting gun of the Christian life. He's not saying here in, in Romans 6 that, that baptism is necessary for salvation. He's not saying that it actually does the saving. But he is saying that for everybody who's become a Christian, that's the starting gun. That's the, that's the thing that launches the, the Christian life. It was a kind of universal experience. See, in the early Christian mind, in, in Paul's mind as he's writing this, all the things that kind of happen around a person's conversions, a regeneration, justification, faith, repentance, conversion, baptism, union with the universal church, grafting in as a member of a local church, all that huge complex of things happened kind of more or less at the, at the same general time. So to Paul, an unbaptized Christian was just unthinkable. Baptism is a universal experience. If, you, if you're a Christian, you've been baptized. And so what he does is he reaches back to that universal experience and he says, listen, when, when that happens, along with all the other things that surround baptism, your faith, your justification, regeneration, all of those things, when that happened, that's when you were united to Jesus. It wasn't at some later point. It's not like a second experience of salvation. It wasn't prior to your conversion. It was at the moment that you put your faith in Jesus, symbolized by baptism. You died with him, and you were resurrected, he says there, to new spiritual life. That's when it happened. Just by the way, this is part of the reason why at Third Avenue Baptist Church here in Louisville, this is part of the reason that we do baptism uh, the way that we do it at Third Avenue. We make a big deal of baptism. Uh, we have the people come to the, to the front of the church after the sermon, into the pulpit, uh, and uh, we encourage them very strongly to give a testimony of how they became a Christian because it encourages the church, and it also says that this baptism that's going to happen here in a few minutes is it, not just a kind of you know, rite of passage. It's not something that you just do at a certain age. It's something that's tied very particularly to a person putting their faith in Jesus. And so we want, we want the congregation, and especially maybe non-believers who are in the congregation, to understand that this is a huge deal. This is, this is that person standing in, uh, up in front of not just a church, but in front of heaven and hell and all of creation, and saying, I am now with Jesus. It's sort of planting the flag in the ground and, and saying, I, I'm with him. I'm on his team. He is my king. And so we make a big deal of it as being this, this image of what's happening in salvation, in our spiritual death and resurrection. Okay, so with those details sort of, sort of nailed down, let's talk about the main thing, this idea of union with Christ. Through, through verses 2, 3, 4, and 5, what's going on is that Paul is taking this gift, this idea, this new idea, union with Christ. He hasn't talked about it yet in the book of Romans, but he's going to start unwrapping it, sort of giving more and more detail through those verses. He says we died. He, said we, he says we are baptized into Christ's death. And then he says that just as Jesus was raised, we are raised. So you can see at each little step through 2, 3, and 4, he's giving us a little more detail. You died at some point. You were baptized with Jesus into his death. You are baptized with Jesus into his life so that you now are raised to, to newness of life too. And it's in verse 5 that he finally sort of gets the gift unwrapped and he holds it up in all of its glory. And so he says there in verse 5, if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. So he's finally gotten to the nub of the thing, and the nub of the thing is that crucial word right there, united. You're united with Christ. Now the word literally means grown together. That's what it means. If you look back at the, if you look back at the Greek that underlies the, the English, it, it's grown together. It's a kind of word from horticulture, like plants. And it means that if you take a a, a, a branch, for instance, and of, a, of a tree or of a vine, and you graft it into another vine, it grows together with that plant or vine until that branch becomes one with that new plant. So that word united there in 6.5 is a perfect word. It, it captures really exactly what Jesus was teaching when he said, I am the vine and you are the branches. So Paul's not just coming up with this on his own either. He's listening to Jesus Listening to Jesus say, at the end of John, I am the vine, you are the branches, and he's learning from it. 
And what he means is that between Jesus Christ and the believer, there is a, a vital and intimate spiritual union. That's what he's trying to get at. You've been united to Christ like, like a branch grafted into a vine so that there's this vital, beautiful, intimate spiritual union between you and Jesus. But still, what does that mean? How does it play out? What, what does it mean theologically? Well, let's start with a definition of what union with Christ is. Uh, a lot of different people through the ages have given definitions of union with Christ, but I think this will kind of get the gist of it. Union with Christ is a phrase that's used to describe the intimate, vital, spiritual unity between Christ and his people. It's a phrase used to describe the intimate, vital, and spiritual unity between Christ and his people in, in virtue of which, or because of which, he is the source of their life and strength and by virtue of which they receive, believers receive, every benefit of salvation. You got that? Union with Christ is a phrase used to describe the vital spiritual unity between Christ and his people in virtue of which, first, he's the source of your life and strength, right? Your life and strength doesn't come just from you. It doesn't just erupt from within your soul. If you have life and strength as a Christian, it comes because you are united to the source of all life and strength, Jesus. That's the first thing. Second thing is that it's through that union with Christ that we receive every benefit of salvation, Everything that comes to you as a Christian does not come directly to you. It's given to Jesus because Jesus has earned it, and you get it simply because you are united to the one who's earned it. You understand that, right? I mean, every benefit of salvation, I mean, you just, you just name it. It doesn't come to you by right. It comes to Jesus by right, and it comes to you by union with Jesus. So just take, for example, justification. Now, what's justification? Justification is a declaration of righteousness, well, you're not righteous. You don't deserve a declaration of righteousness. You don't have justification by right. No, it's Jesus who earned the declaration of righteousness from the Father. You get it simply because you're united to the vine. And what happens to the vine also happens to the branches. The resurrection at the end of time, that's not yours by right. You're going to rise from the grave simply and solely and only because Jesus, the vine, rose from the grave. And what happens to the vine also happens to you, the branch. See, this is why, this is why, this is why the resurrection is so crucial to the, to the whole Christian faith. I, one of the things that, that you'll find over and over again is that, that Christians believe Jesus rose from the dead, right? That's, that's no problem. We think Jesus rose from the dead. But when you ask the question, why was that necessary? You, you get all kinds of answers. And I think most of us as Christians think of the resurrection mostly as a kind of awesome exclamation point at the end of the story, right? Jesus rose from the dead, and that's, that's awesome because it, gets, it puts a good exclamation point at the end of the story. But, but why couldn't God just save us even if Jesus remained dead? I mean, think about that. Why couldn't he save us even if Jesus remained dead? I mean, Jesus had paid the penalty for sin, right? He had lived the perfect life. Paid the penalty for sin in his death. So, so everything's clear. Why couldn't God just impute all of that to you and save you even if Jesus remained dead? So that it wasn't just, you know, nice of him to raise Jesus from the dead. Why is it necessary to your salvation? The answer is, this, it, it's, it's found in this idea of union with Christ. It is that what happens to the vine happens to the branches so that if the vine remains dead, so do the branches. You are only going to be resurrected to life because the vine to which you are attached was raised to life. Your resurrection, your regeneration, your new life, your justification, your sanctification, your glorification at the end of time, all of it comes to you just like oil that comes off the head of the king as it is poured out on him. All right, so that's the main idea. You see this idea all over the New Testament, by the way. Our relationship with Jesus in various places in the New Testament is said to be like a building with Christ as the foundation. It's said to be like a marriage covenant. It's said to be like a body. It's said to be like a vine and branches, as we've already talked about. And each one of those images, from a building to a marriage covenant, to vine and branches, to, to a body, you can see the idea of unity of the, of the parts, right? So what happens to one part also happens to the whole. And the New Testament describes our relationship to Jesus all over the place in all these different images. But where does it come from? The idea that, that we are united to Christ in this way such that what happens to him happens to us. Well, well, it comes from Jesus, right? 
We've already talked about how he said, I'm the vine and you are the branches. That's one place. In John 14, verse 20, he says too, I am in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. It's an incredible image of unity there. And then you've got this wonderful story in Acts 9 where Paul himself is converted. And what, what does Jesus say to him on the road to Damascus as he's, he's off to persecute the church? You've probably all heard Mark Dever say this if you've been around nine marks at all. He, he says to Paul, or Saul at the time, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting my people? No, he doesn't. He doesn't say my people. He doesn't say my church. He doesn't say those people, those I love. He doesn't say anything like that. He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? You see the unity there? Do you see how, how much Jesus identifies with and is united to his people? It says that when Saul is persecuting the church, he's persecuting the body of Christ. He's persecuting Christ because Christ and his people are united. It's all over the New Testament. Now, let's talk through this a little bit more deeply even by unpacking a couple of aspects of our relationship with Jesus that are, are talked about many, many times all over the New Testament. Number one, we are in Christ. And number two, Christ is in us. We are in Christ and Christ is in us. I just want to unpack those two ideas a little bit. There's, I mean, you start, you start thinking about this and you start reading the Bible in, in these terms and you realize that there's treasure enough here to last a lifetime of, of studying and of worshiping. But, but maybe these few minutes will just kind of crack the door a little bit to get us started thinking about this amazing reality of our union with Christ. So first of all, these are two things that the Bible says over and over again. We are in Christ and Christ is in us. And you'll find that over and over again. Uh, every time you see the phrase in Christ, you're going to do this thing in Christ. That's not just religious spiritual mumbo jumbo that the apostles threw in there just to make it sound more spiritual. It, it, they're, they're thinking there about union with Christ. They're thinking about the fact that we are in Christ, Christ is in us. So you see that phrase all over the New Testament. We are in Christ it's a profound truth. In fact, the, the truth that we are in Christ is, if you read the New Testament, rooted in eternity past. It's rooted all the way back in God's eternal plan of redemption when he determined in his election that we should be united to Christ. So, you see, in Ephesians, Paul says, he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. In 2 Timothy, Paul writes, he saved us not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. You see the, you see the meaning of that? You see, the, see what's going on there? In eternity past, God united you to Jesus. He gave you to Jesus so that Jesus' work wasn't just a shot in the dark. It was a rescue mission of a particular chosen people. We are in Christ. Also what that means is that we were and are in Christ in his death and resurrection. That's what Paul talks about here in these verses. What Christ did in his death, in his resurrection, God conceived of us doing in him and with him. So that when Jesus lived, God thought of it as us living. When Jesus died, God thought of it as us dying. That's why it's right and fitting, in fact, for God to impute our sins and his righteousness one to the other. And also when Jesus rose, Paul says here, that resurrection life, that resurrection power is the same power that ignited spiritual life in us. So the whole thing has to do all the way back in eternity past. You're united to Christ. In the present, you're united to Christ. What he did, God looks at you as having done. But it also, if you read the New Testament, rockets out into eternity future. So look at verse 5. It says there that we will be united with Christ in a resurrection like his. We will be united with him in resurrection. I mean, Paul says there, it, the resurrection life of Christ already started in you with spiritual resurrection, but it will be finished with bodily resurrection. Not just spiritual, but, but bodily. His life is and will be ours. His triumph is and will be ours. I hope you can see the point of this. Every single blessing of salvation that you have comes to you not by right but because of your union with Jesus. So we are in Christ. Second though, second thing to notice is that Christ is in us. Christ is in us. Think of that image of the vine for just a second. The image of the vine. 
The li- what, what happens when a branch is united to a vine? Well, the life and the energy of that vine sort of enlivens each one of the branch. The, the sap and the fluid of that vine flows through the whole of the plant from the source, which is the vine itself. Well, friends, it's the same thing with you and Jesus if you're a Christian. The same thing happens when when you're united to Christ. His resurrection life pushes through and flows through you. The work of the the Holy Spirit is to cause that life to go into you and through you. There are all kinds of ramifications for that in your life. To understand that you're united to Christ and his life is in you and, and through you. For one thing, it's just humbling and it's empowering. It's massively humbling and empowering. Life comes from being united to the vine. And if you're not united to the vine, Jesus... There's no life there. It's also transforming, right? It's humbling, it's empowering, it's transforming. You you graft a a fruitless olive branch onto a strong, fruitful tree, and what happens? Well, well the, the life of that strong, fruitful tree starts to move through that branch and cause it to be fruitful. It transforms the branch. Same thing is true with us, with our experiences, with our suffering, with our lives. It's also uniting. I mean, the fact that The fact that that we are, every single one of us, united to Christ also unites us to each other, right? Same image of the the body of the church. We are, as a body of believers in your your local church, in my local church, each of us, we're growing up and growing together, the Bible says, like a body with Christ at the head. It's Christ in us, and, and we are united. It's also just massively encouraging, I think, and that it gives courage for the fight that we have against sin against the world and the flesh and the devil. I mean, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, Paul talks about the riches of the glory of the mystery of the gospel, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The hope of glory is Christ in us. So that's the kind of idea of what Paul is talking about here with union with Christ. It's Christ in us and we in Christ. In verse 5, though, Paul shifts a little bit and lets us know that he, he's going to go a little bit more deeply into this whole thing. He's going to talk about two aspects of this, of this whole thing in particular. He's, you've got Christ in us, us in Christ, but, but two specific things that have big ramifications. In verse 5, he tells us what those are going to be. First of all, what it means to be united to Christ in death. And then number two, what it means to be united to Christ in, in life. So that's, verse 5 functions as a sort of topic sentence. Where he says, I'm going to talk about union with Christ in his death first. Then I'm going to talk about union with Christ in his life second. Then in verses 6 to 7, this is just kind of structure of the argument. 6 to 7, he talks first about the ramifications of being united to Christ in his death. And then in verse 8, he shifts the whole thing to begin talking about the ramifications of being united to Christ in life. So in 6 to 7, Paul says that three things essentially are true of us. I'm just going to run through those real fast. First, he says, because you're united to Jesus, when he died on the cross, our old self was crucified with him, right? When you're united to Jesus, because you're united to Jesus, when he died on the cross, our old self was crucified with him. Second thing he says is that that then leads to the body of sin being brought to nothing or being done away with. And then third, he says, All of this is so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. So so what is he talking about? In 6 to 7, you die with Christ. And what's the result of that? What does it mean? It means that Jesus' death on the cross causes this world-shattering change in you once you become united to him. When he died on the cross, Paul says, you died on the cross too. God looked at it as if you were dying. In other words, what we were, our old self, was put to death and it it ceased to be. You get the same idea in that phrase there, the body of sin. So that the body of sin might be done away with, that the body of sin might might be put away. What you've got there is a picture of sin personified. It's like, a, it's like sin pictured as a body, as if it had a body, hanging on the cross and being executed. And what Paul is saying there is that what you were is no more. And, and what were we? Well, you look through the New Testament, you see it all over the place. You understand that we are not generally and fundamentally good people. We're not generally and fundamentally ethically right and morally upstanding people. We are, as the Bible says over and over again, children of wrath, children of the devil, Sinners, rebels against God. And and the problem is that has profound effects in our lives. It it warps our desires. It it breaks our motivations. It breaks our love so that we want and desire and pursue the wrong things. We're filled, as Paul says earlier in the book of Romans, filled with selfishness and ruthlessness and heartlessness and godlessness. That's what marks us. 
And even worse, it's not just like we can make a few decisions to, to change that. What he says is that we are enslaved to sin, and it's a slavery that we can't free ourselves from. If you know yourself very well as a human being, you know that that's true. I mean, the desire, the, even the motivation to rebel against God is deep in your heart. Sin has its throne deep down in your heart. And if you know yourself well enough, you know that it coerces obedience from you. No matter how hard you try to reason your way out of it or how hard you, you, you try to feel bad about your sin or even decide that you're going to stand here now and assert your will against it. Sin's dominion is deep. But that's the old self. That's the body of sin. That's, that's humanity as it exists with the sap of death and sin coursing through us, dominating us, twisting us into these sort of wretched slaves and rebels against God. But Paul says when you become a Christian, when you put your faith in Jesus and you're united to him, what happens is that that, that wretched, rebellious old self is crucified and put to death. Sin's dominion is broken. Its throne, even in the deepest recesses of your heart, is overturned. But how's that happen? How's it happen? Well, the answer is in 7, verse 7. The answer to how this happens is in verse 7. Look at it with me. Paul says there, the reason that we would no longer be enslaved to sin, that's how he ended verse 6, is because, or for, one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, what does that mean? How can sin's dominion be overturned? Well, it's because one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, the key to understanding all this, key to understanding that, verse 7, is seeing that it's not just some universal truism. You don't just have a kind of maxim here that's true of everybody. I mean, what would it even mean to say that everybody who dies is free from sin? I mean, that's just, that's not even true, right? It's just not true that everybody who dies is all of a sudden free from sin. No, it, what this is doing in verse 7 is saying something far more specific. What it's saying is that the one who has died in Christ, the one who has died with Christ, just like Paul's been talking about from the beginning of the chapter, it's that person who is set free from sin. But there's something else here, too, that's, that's just super important. It's not really set free from sin. That word set free is actually justified. The one who has died with Christ is justified from sin. So you, you see the importance of this? The thing that breaks sin's dominion over you, the thing that overturns sin's dominion over you is your justification. It's God's declaration over your life that you are righteous because of Jesus. So that's what Jesus' death did. It united you to him so that your sin was imputed to him and his righteousness was imputed to you. He dies for your sin and you are declared righteous. That's what justification is. But Paul is saying here that once that happens, it is that very declaration of righteousness that breaks sin's dominion over you. That's what does it. That's what breaks sin's dominion. The old self is crucified, the body of sin is broken, it's destroyed, and its enslavement of you is ended because you were declared righteous of it. I want you to think about that for just a second as we think about this idea. It, it, it's crucial that you as a Christian embrace forgiveness. It's crucial that you as a Christian embrace forgiveness. Did, did you know that there is no spiritual value in just sitting in the guilt of sin. There's no spiritual value in just sitting in the guilt of sin. I, I think sometimes Christians think that we get extra points with God somehow for just feeling bad about our sin for a really long time. But do you see in this passage that if it is the declaration of justification, you're righteous, if that's the thing that breaks sin's dominion and topples its throne, it's crucial that you embrace God's declaration of righteousness over your life. You see what creates enslavement to sin? It's, it's guilt. And so when you, even as a Christian, sit in guilt, it's not like sin's chains are still on your feet, right? 
Sin's chains on your feet have been broken. But if all you do in your Christian life is just sit in the guilt of your sins, essentially what you're doing is just letting phantom chains wrap around your ankles again. You have to embrace forgiveness as a, sin, uh, uh, embrace forgiveness as a Christian. I mean, I, I know that there are places in the Bible that say, you know, for example, in the Psalms, a broken and contrite heart the Lord will not despise. And, and that's true. But read through the New Testament and you see it really clearly that we as Christians were never meant to just sit there in our brokenness. We were meant to turn to Christ and find forgiveness and let his life course through us and then stand up and live. That's what we're made for. I know Christians talk about a lot being broken over their sin and they pray to be broken over their sin. And they think it's a very good thing when that sense of brokenness comes. But friend, when the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin, when the Holy Spirit gives you a sense of brokenness, don't just sit in it. Turn to Christ and find life and get on with it. Embrace forgiveness. Here's the third point. The third point. You have new life with Christ. You have new life with Christ. There's a huge shift in this passage that takes place in verse 8. Paul's been talking about, our implication, about the implications of our union with Christ when it comes to his death. That's kind of what was going on in 5, 6, and 7. Those were those verses. But in 8, you, you've got this rocket that's sort of shooting off to, to, to get into orbit. And 5, 6, and 7 shoot us into a, a certain level of orbit. But then starting in verse 8, it's like, it's like the, the rocket booster sort of breaks off and another one fires and pushes the whole thing even higher. Because Paul says there in verse 8, it's not just that we've died with Christ. It's that we will also live with Christ which is a whole different level of spiritual reality. Now, let's look at just a couple of details there, first of all, in verse 8. First of all, notice in verse 8, the little word will. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. You see that? That means that what Paul is talking about here is something in the future, it's a future tense verb. It's, it's something that's going to happen in time, in the future. Same in verse 5. We shall be united with him in a resurrection like his. Well, what's this future thing that we're looking forward to? Well, it's the resurrection of our bodies, right? I mean, that's the thing that, that the Lord is, is holding out to us as the great promise, that we will be resurrected not just in spirit but in body. But it's also not just future. This resurrection life that we live now with Christ because we're united with him, it's not just future, it's also present. So look at verse 4, and you can see that. Because we are united with Christ in his death and in his resurrection, we walk now in newness of life. And then you look at verse 11, too, and you see the same thing. You, un you should understand yourselves now to be alive to God in Jesus Christ. So do you see the picture that, he, that he's painting here. Because you're united to Christ, what happens is that once you're united to that vine, his resurrection life starts to work in your life and in your soul immediately. That's already happening if you're a Christian. You're united to Christ and his resurrection life and power is already working in you in all kinds of different ways. We're going to talk about some of them a little bit later. But that resurrection life that's in you is not all that's going to happen. You've not got the whole prize yet. You've not got the whole reward yet. There's still something yet future. Because at the last day, that spiritual resurrection that you experience, the minute you become a Christian, is going to grow to embrace everything. And even your dead body in the grave is going to be resurrected. But it's already working. You're united to the vine, and it's already working. That's what Paul wants you to know. Here's another detail, just, just a minor thing to talk about for just a minute. Verse 9 there Verse 9 doesn't actually begin a new sentence. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. If you're looking at the ESV, verse 9 looks like a new sentence. It's actually not a new sentence. It, it's, just, it's just the word knowing. If we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him knowing that Christ being raised from the dead. Now, that's important to see that. That is not just a new sentence. is important because verse 8 says we believe we're going to live with Christ. In other words, we have confidence that, that, that that's going to happen. We think that it's true. We're trusting in him. We have confidence that that's true. But it's crucial also to see that that belief that you're going to live with Christ on the last day is not a groundless confidence. It's not something that you, just, that you just kind of pull out of the air and say, I have no good evidence for this, but I still believe that I'm going to live with Christ. 
Do you see that that's what Paul, that's what Paul's trying to, that's the point that he's trying to make here. Your confidence that you're going to be resurrected with Christ at the last day is not groundless. It's grounded on knowledge. You have confidence that you're going to live because you know that Christ himself has already been raised and is never going to die again. So here's, this is something that I try to get across to non-Christians all the time. When I'm preaching, when I'm talking with them, when I'm having conversations, I, I want people to understand that Christianity is not just a reasonless leap of faith. It's not just an illogical set of beliefs that we all believe just because. No, Christianity is belief or confidence that's based on knowledge. And it's based on the knowledge that Jesus rose from the dead. Look, when you're, when you're talking with a non-Christian, when you're trying to convince them of the truth of the gospel, don't get wrapped up in all of the things that form a kind of smoke screen around people's unbelief. I mean, non-Christians are going to want to talk to you about political things going on in the nation. They're going to talk to you about all of the political stances that they think every Christian in the world takes and that they don't like about it. They're going to want to talk to you about the flood. They're going to want to talk to you about creation. And all of those things are just mostly kind of a smoke screen around the core of their unbelief. So maybe talk about those things for a little bit. Show that you, you really do know how to talk about things like creation and the flood and maybe even political things in a reasonable way. Maybe show them that, but eventually, maybe even quickly, go to the nub of the matter and say, listen, I mean, I had a conversation with a guy like this not, not two weeks ago, standing in the foyer of my church. We, we had finished the service, and he came back to, to talk to me, and uh, he, he wanted to talk about, I forget what it was, I think it was politics that he wanted to talk about. And I said, listen, you, you know, we, we can have this conversation about politics and about the way Christians think about certain political issues. That, that's fine. We can have a conversation about that. But... If you really want to get at the nub of Christianity or if you want to try to sort of knock me off my own Christian horse and make me doubt my own faith, we're going to have to deal with the question together, did Jesus rise from the dead or did he not? Right? I mean, because the whole of Christianity rises or falls on the question, do you really believe that in history Jesus got up from the dead or not? If he did, well, then everything just falls into place like clockwork, right? Right? Everything, the whole superstructure of Christian doctrine and belief falls into place if you believe Jesus rose from the dead. But if he didn't rise from the dead, well, it doesn't matter. It's just like, never mind, let's all just go home. Christianity rests on the foundation of Jesus' resurrection, and that's why Paul says that we believe that this is going to happen to us in the future because we know that Jesus rose from the dead. Anyway, in verses 9 and 10, Paul talks more about this idea of our being united to Christ and his resurrection. And he, he says essentially two things about the ramifications of that. First of all, he says, we will live forever. That's the first thing he says. We are going to live forever. Second, he says, we have eternal life. Well, now that's interesting, right? Because those sound like the same thing. If you're going to live forever, doesn't that sound exactly like eternal life? Well, it's, it's not exactly the same, so let me explain. So first, in verse 9 there, you can see in verse 9, he just reminds us that Jesus is done with death. That's the first thing. Paul reminds us that Jesus is done with death. He's never going to die again. Having died and having come out the other side of death, death has got no more claim on him whatsoever. And therefore, if you're united to Jesus, then the same is going to be true of you. You are going to die physically, just like the whole rest of the human race that's under sin. But then, for you, with regard to you, death will be no more. Death is going to lose its grip on you entirely, and you are going to live forever. The vine lives, and therefore the branches live. You're going to live forever. Second thing he says, though, in verse 10 is slightly different, though. It's not just that we're going to live forever. It's, going to, it's that we have eternal life. So look at verse 10. Chapter 6, verse 10. What he says there is that Jesus is irrevocably separated now from sin. He's irrevocably separated from sin. That's what, the, that's what the phrase there, died to sin, means. Death freed him from the burden of sin. Now, obviously, Jesus didn't have the burden of sin in the same way that we do. He wasn't, he wasn't guilty of it. It doesn't mean that he sinned himself. But the burden that Jesus bore of our sin fell off when he died. And now he is separated from it. He's over it. He's beyond it. So that he now lives to God. He lives before God's face. He lives in God's presence and with God's power. That's exactly the kind of thing that the Bible describes again and again as eternal life. Eternal life doesn't just mean living forever. It means more like the life of eternity. 
the life of God. And that's not just something that happens in the future. It's something that's already operating now. So if that's true of Jesus, if he is living his life with resurrection, eternal life, then that's true of you too if you're united to him. It's not just that God gives that to you directly. Eternal life is Jesus' by right, and you get it because you're united to him. You see, you see what we're saying here? You put all this together, and what you get is this beautiful picture of the penalty of sin, death, being broken so that we live forever. But you also get the truth in the Bible that the dominion of sin, not just its penalty, but its dominion is broken so that we now live the life of eternity. It's just an amazing reality. You're united to Christ. The old self is crucified and broken. Its dominion is destroyed. Its chains are broken. Its thrones toppled, right? The old hymn that we sing sometimes in my church, my chains fell off, my heart was free. But it doesn't stop there either. We don't just live our lives sort of standing in the dungeon with broken chains at our feet, right? And the hymn doesn't stop there either. It goes on. My chains fell off, my heart was free, and therefore I rose and I went forth and I followed thee, right? You don't just die with Christ, you rise with him. You now live, if you are united with Christ, in newness of life, and you've got eternity stretching out before you. Now, in the next couple of verses, Paul goes on and he says, look, if this is true, then what this calls for from you is, is action now on your part. So in verses 11 and 12 and 13, Paul says there, there, there's something that you've got to do in, in response to all of this. Look at the first thing he says there in verse 11. In light of all this, he says, therefore, consider, consider yourselves. And it's, a, it's an important word. It doesn't just mean think about. It, it means something more like reckon or, or set down to your account. So, so what is it that we set down to our account? Well, we set down to our account that we are dead to sin and alive to God right? It's simple, but it's, it's, it's profound. You have to take all these truths about the gospel, that you are dead to sin, that you are alive to God, that you are united to Christ, that his resurrection life flows through you, that you've been raised to newness of life, and eternity is coming, and your body's going to be resurrected. Take all those truths and set them to your account. Believe them about yourself. It's not just truths in a book. These are realities that are true of you. And then what? Once those things are set down to your account, then what? Well, well verses 12 and 13... Act like what you are then. If you're united to Christ and his resurrection life flows through you and if all of those things is, are, are true, then don't let sin continue to reign. His throne is overturned. Present the parts of your body, present the members of your life, the parts of yourself to God and not to sin. You're not one who's a slave to sin anymore, he says. You're one who has been brought from death to life, united to Christ. So why would you go on licking the boots of sin and bowing and scraping in front of that old master? Stand up and declare war. The throne of sin is toppled. Yeah, sin still fights in our lives, doesn't it? Sin still fights. Sin still puts up a battle. But the glorious thing is that it doesn't fight from the throne anymore. The battle that sin fights against us is a guerrilla war. It doesn't fight from the throne. Christ sits on the throne. So friend, be bold in your fight against sin. When sin beats you, don't just turn around and say, well, okay, I guess you got me. You know, that's it. There's no reason for me to try any longer. No. If you're a Christian, there are only, you've only got two options, right? When sin beats you down yet again. Your only two options are to stay down on your knees and prove that you never had the life of Christ in you in the first place. Or stand up again and fight. You're united to Christ. Fight sin. Let's take just a few minutes then. And talk finally just about a few more of these implications. A few more implications that come out of this truth of our union with Christ. Down into the nitty gritty a little bit. How does all this affect us? If we're united to Christ, if we're in him and he is in us, if we've died with him, if we've been raised to newness of life with him, how does that affect us? Well, I want to give you five ways, five ways that it affects us. But, but I, I want you to just stop and pause before we go to those five things. I want you to understand first and foremost that this idea of union with Christ is, is not just sort of another way of thinking about it. It's not just another metaphor. It's not just a, a new perspective. Your union with Christ is is the reality of your salvation. To be saved is to be united to Christ. And, and all those things that we've talked about are made possible and empowered and made actual because of your union with Christ. All right, so five implications 
of being united to Jesus. Number one, number one, our union with Christ makes us sensible of our utter dependence on Jesus. Our union with Christ makes us sensible of our utter dependence on Jesus. When Jesus said, I'm the vine and you are the branches, he followed that up by saying, whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. In fact, he said right after that, if anybody does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers. You see, when you are actually a Christian, when your faith is in Jesus Christ, then your heart, which is united to Jesus, is going to know deep down inside that salvation and life and blessing come from him, and your heart will rejoice because of that. So friend, as a Christian, do you have that sense of dependence about you? That you are utterly and completely dependent on Jesus Christ? Or is there some part of you somewhere deep down inside that takes pride somehow for who you are, for what you've done, maybe even for the decision that you made some time ago to follow Jesus that somebody else didn't make. Our union with Christ makes us sensible of our utter dependence on Jesus. Number two, our union with Jesus secures for us the continually transforming power of Christ's life. Our union with Jesus secures for us the continually transforming power of his life. It's like, a, it's like an olive branch that's given new life as the sap presses into its twigs and, and leaves. We too, Paul says, in another place are being transformed from one degree of glory to another as the life of Christ works its way through us and in us. Do, do you see that kind of thing in your life? That kind of transforming power of Jesus? working through the twigs and branches of, of, of your life. You see it kind of across the waterfront of your life, new, new affections, new loves, new desires. What about suffering? You know, when, you, when you encounter hardship in your life, do you, in, do you encounter and engage that suffering now differently than you did before you were united to Christ? What about when you even look back on experiences of your life or suffering? in your life, when you look back on those old memories, do, do you look back on those things differently? Now, friend, if you're united to Christ, then his life coursing through you transforms it all. Even those old memories. There, there was a, a, a woman in my church, a member of the church, who um, in her first pregnancy wound up with all kinds of complications uh, in the birth of, uh, of her daughter. And, and she nearly died. And there were days on end where it was a, just a, a very dark and frightening experience for both, both her and her husband. She, she tells that story, though, and tells about the, the dark time that they went through in those few days. But then she says, but, but, you know, the memory of standing on the precipice of death there with the birth of my first daughter did, didn't just, just quit. It sort, of, it sort of moved through the rest of my life with me so that when I thought about that experience which was sort of inescapable because her daughter was sort of all around all the time when she would think about that it would just fill her with a sort of a sort of dread and despair but but I heard her tell this story once and and she said but you know it was amazing how over time and through the years God actually rewrote that experience so that instead of being a memory that filled her with dread and with doubt and with despair, she said, I actually began to be amazed at God's ability to bring such joy out of such a sorrowful reality. And, and she started to think, look, if, if God can bring such joy out of such pain in this life, what is he going to be able to do in eternity? There's another lady in my church, a dear, dear sister, um, who uh, years ago, actually in the, in the month of February, uh, uh, attempted suicide. Um, and uh, uh, every year now, when February rolls around, a particular day on, in February, she's, she's filled with a sort of dread and, and despair because she thinks of it as the anniversary of the day of her attempted suicide. Well, th this year she... She phoned my wife on that particular day, and she said, I'm just, I'm just feeling terrible. I just, I just feel filled up with despair 
about this whole thing. And, and, and my wife said to her, listen, dear sister, you're going to have to let the power of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit transform that memory for you. You need to think about that no longer as the anniversary of the day you tried to commit suicide, but as the anniversary of the day that the Lord saved your life. You see, when, when the power of Christ is flowing through your life, your suffering is transformed, your future is transformed, your motivations and loves and desires are transformed, but even, friends, your memories are transformed. For her, it was no longer the anniversary of an attempted suicide but the anniversary of when God saved her life. Here's number three. Number three, our union with Christ creates union between believers, especially in each individual local church. Our union with Christ creates union between believers, especially in each individual local church. I'd love to preach a whole sermon on this, and I probably will at some point. Uh, in my own church. But if you read Matthew 16 and Matthew 18, and if you read 1 Corinthians 12 and 13 and 14, then you know that to be united to Christ is to be united to his body, right? And yes, in the Bible, that means to be united to the universal church, so all believers everywhere. But until we all get to heaven, the expression of that universal church is the local church, just like the ones that you pastor and that you attend. So look, the the reality is that you cannot be a faithful Christian and remain unconnected to a local church. It's just the natural outworking of being united to Christ. It's, It's like a branch on a tree. Again, once connected, the natural outcome of that branch being connected to that tree is that that branch will begin to produce leaves and buds and eventually fruit, right? That's just the natural outcome. Well, the same thing is true when you're united to Christ, Once you're connected to Christ, once you're connected to the universal church, the sort of natural growth and outcome of that is for a Christian to commit as a vital member of a local church. The application there is just really simple. If you're a Christian and you're not a member of a church, you need to be. Join a church. It's just unthinkable for a Christian who is united to Christ not to be united to his body. Here's number four. Our union with Christ is effects a break in our union with the old fallen creation. Our union with Christ effects a break in our union with the old fallen creation. So our allegiance to and union with King Adam, the fallen, is is broken. We are united anew to King Jesus, the resurrected. It's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians, if anyone is in Christ, behold, new creation. And friends, if that has happened, as Paul says, then we have died to sin. We have been united to Christ and therefore we can't continue to live under the dominion of sin. Here's number five. Our union with Christ means that we are in fellowship with Christ in his suffering, in his death, and ultimately in his triumph. Our union with Christ means that we are in fellowship with Christ in his suffering, in his death, and ultimately also in his triumph. To be united with Christ means that our suffering in this life is is now something entirely different. It has a different purpose. It's not filled up with the punishment from God. It's not, and and there is at the end of the whole thing a reward. One day, friend, if you are united to Christ, you are going to reign with him. The Bible even says that you are right now seated with him in the heavenlies. The Bible even says that now the spirit cries out from within you, Abba, Father, This one is a prince of heaven. I want to close just by reading a a beautiful quote about this whole idea of union with Christ from John Murray. John, John Murray writes here, listen to what he says. He says, union with Christ has its source in the election of God the Father before the foundation of the world. And it has its fruition in the glorification of the sons of God at the end. Therefore, the perspective of God's people is in no way narrow. It is broad and it is long. It's not confined to space and time. It has the expanse of eternity from the electing love of God the Father in the counsels of eternity to his glorification with Christ in the last day. It has no beginning and it has no end. So how, therefore, can the believer walk through life with such joy? How can he have patience in the perplexities and adversities of the present day? How can he have confident assurance with reference to the future and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God? Well, it is because he cannot even think of past or present or future. 
apart from his union with Christ. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you and we praise you that you have acted to save us in Jesus. We thank you that you have united us to your son, Jesus, so that we have died with him, so that we have been raised to newness of life, and so that in the future we will be resurrected bodily to eternal life. Oh Lord, we pray that you would help us as Christians, as believers in Jesus Christ, to live in the light of this all the days of our lives until you come to bring us safely home. All of this, we pray in the name of Jesus and to his honor and glory. Amen.